it's my great pleasure to welcome you here to our third um, in a three trilogy series, Telephone Canada, Tell It To Watch, here for our lunchtime sessions. And it's my very great pleasure to introduce you to Carol Brabant, the Executive Director of Telephone Canada, to uh, welcome you into their studio. Hello, uh, welcome to TIFF Day 7, and it's starting to show, I don't know for you, but for me, it's goodbye, I eel, welcome class. <laughs> so I appreciate everyone coming out for our third and last session of Talent to Watch series, entitled Not Short on Talent, and you will soon see what I mean. 2011 has been, as I was just uh, telling, uh, our presenter, uh, has been a very big year uh, for Telefilm. We've launched a number of initiatives to promote Canadian filmmakers. A few weeks prior to TIFF, Telefilm showcased 12 films all slated for this festival to the New York industry with TIFF co-director Cameron Bailey as part of Eye on TIFF. And with talent to watch, we get to spotlight our brightest Canadian filmmakers to Canadian and international industry and media attention. Notre industrie ne manque certainement pas de réel talent cette année. Marie Cage de Guy Edouin a donné le coup d'envoi au programme Canada First et nous étions là pour célébrer la sortie du premier long métrage d'un ré réalisateur qui a fait sa marque avec une série de courts métrages tout à fait remarquables. Canadians excel in the short format. Today's forum will give you the opportunity to meet the creative minds behind these wonderfully colorful, inventive, and audacious films. Today's moderators play a vital role at TIFF Bell Lightbox. He is the director of public programming, a role which he eloquently describes on his Twitter page as director of the fun stuff. <laughs> and, it, and it is indeed fun. In the past year, he and his team have established TIFF Bell Lightbox as a major cultural destination dedicated to the celebration of film culture. It is my pleasure to welcome Shane Smith. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great uh, to see so many of you here. Please excuse my festival raspy voice. Lots of small talk and uh, the odd drink or two. Um, we, uh, I'm very happy to see the spotlight shined on short films today, and we've got an outstanding group of talented directors on stage, thank you, uh, who all, all of whom have a short film screening in the festival this year. They've got a variety of backgrounds, uh, their films are incredibly diverse, and they each have unique experiences in making their films and developing their careers that they will share with us today. Um, there's lots to talk about. I'm going to introduce them briefly now, uh, do their bios so that you know who they are, and then they are going to introduce their films. We'll see some clips, and then we will uh, get into some probing questions uh, from you, hopefully, and, and also from me. I've got some, some questions to ask these guys. I want to know who you are first. Do we have any filmmakers, short filmmakers, in the audience? Show of hands. Great. Um, anybody who wants to be a short filmmaker? Great, a couple of emerging make filmmakers, producers, industry folks. We have some of those here. Fans of short films. Okay, good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. All right, let's get into it. I think uh, we'll go in the uh, order that they are seated here. Uh, first up is Andrew uh, Cividino, the director of We Ate the Children Last. Uh, Andrew grew up in Dundas, Ontario, and completed a BFA in film studies at Ryerson University School of Image Arts. He went on to create an award-winning public service announcement for the Ontario Film Review Board in 2006, and he was named Motorola's Filmmaker of the Year after winning the TIFF Motorola Motor Reel competition. Andrew founded Film Forge Productions in 2007 as a conduit for his creative and commercial directing work. Through Film Forge, he's produced and directed films with support from the National Film Board of Canada, Ontario and Toronto Arts Councils, and Bravo. He mentioned some funders in his bio. Good lesson. Uh, Andrew's short Mud, based on the short story by Jeffrey Forsyth, screened at the Montreal World Film Festival and Edmonton International Film Festival in 2009, and Andrew is currently developing his first feature-length film. Please welcome Andrew Cividino. 
next up, uh, Sophie Goyette. Sophie is the director of Le Ronde, and she's a screenwriter and filmmaker from Montreal. Since 2008, she's written, produced, and directed the shorts uh, En Parallel, A L'Etat Sauvage, and Manège, Rides, which have all played on the festival circuit. Her creative approach is influenced by both the rigor and authenticity of Kozlowski and by the dreamlike quality of Benders. Le Ronde is her fourth film, and she's currently completing her next short, Le Future Proche, and is writing her first feature film. Please welcome Sophie. <laughs> we have uh, Mark, Mark Slutsky, the director of Sorry Rabbi. He's a Montreal-based filmmaker, food writer, and former food critic, uh, film critic. He's directed the films The Recommendations in 2005 and Sorry Rabbi, which he also wrote. He spent 10 years as a core member of ultra-low-budget micro-indie automatic vaudeville studios, playing pretty much every conceivable role behind and in front of the camera, culminating in the group's feature film, Peepers, which was distributed by E1, which he co-wrote and produced. He's currently the writer on Young Chang's The Fruit Hunters and is writing his feature directorial debut, Breaking the Band, with the support of Telefilm. Well done, Mark. Welcome, Mark. <laughs> Chelsea. Chelsea McMullen, director of Derailments. She studied film at York University. Over the past 10 years, she's made a number of films that have been shown at festivals. Her first short to screen at TIFF was Plume in 2006. In 2008, her short Slip earned her Kodak Award for Best Cinematography in a Canadian Short and Best Experimental Short at the CFC Worldwide Short Film Festival. The following year, she directed two feature documentaries, The Way Must Be Tried and Dead Man. Dead Man screened at TIFF. Derailments is her latest film. Welcome, Chelsea. <laughs> Dusty. Dusty Mancinelli, director of Pathways, received a BFA in film production from York University. He's a Toronto-based filmmaker and photographer whose work has been published in newspapers across Canada. He's directed the short films Death to Charlie in 2006, Pure 2007, and Soap 2009. They've screened at film festivals across North America, including the Whistler International Film Festival, Washington, D.C. Independent Film Festival, and the Cinema Sudbury International Film Festival. Pathways is his new short film. Welcome, Dusty. <laughs> and finally, Craig Goodwill, the director of Patchtown. Craig's been a director in film and television for over 10 years. He's traveled the world, directing and producing films and television for National Geographic, CBC, Alliance Atlantis, Bravo, HGTV, UK Style, and many more. Many of his films have been selected by world-renowned film festivals, and he's also directed award-winning commercials for Nike, Bank of America, Whiskers, Pedigree, and Nokia. His first step into film was as a producer, director's assistant for Hollywood films, including Goodwill Hunting, Studio 54, Superstar, Storm of the Century, and many more. He's worked as a producer director with Much Music and has produced several high-profile music videos for Universal Records. Goodwill was also the senior producer of the groundbreaking television series U8TV, The Lofters, which was filmed in Toronto. And Patchtown is his first dramatic short. Please welcome Craig. <laughs> so those are uh, your filmmakers on stage today. Um, I'm going to introduce them uh, in order. We're, they're going to give us the elevator pitch for their film, tell you what it's about in one sentence or two, and then uh, we'll see some clips from each of their films. First up, we're going to start with you, Mark. Sorry, Rabbi. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Rabbi is a movie based on my experiences of living as a secular, completely non-practicing Jew in a very Hasidic neighborhood. Um, basically came out of me wondering what my neighbors thought of me, uh, whether they thought of me as a uh, Jew like they were, or didn't even see me at all. So I, uh, based on some experiences, I wrote this film which I uh, developed with Sodex uh, Kuek and, uh, and and made this little movie about Hasidim. <laughs> Let's see some clips.
By the way, cutting a trailer for a short film is a very good idea. Can I say something about that trailer? Yeah. It's uh, a trailer makes the movie look a lot more uh, dramatic and scary <laughs> than it actually is. <laughs> Than I, a comedy uh, should be. <laughs> I, wa I, wa I was. It almost was cut together a bit as a as a joke because I wanted to cut a dialogue list trailer because the only uh, QuickTime file I had at the time had temporary music on it over a lot of the dialogue, uh, so I took uh, some very dramatic music and I I just sort of ran with it. So it's a bit uh, misrepresentative of the film, which is a comedy, <laughs> <laughs> though you may not know it. From the we call it the scary trailer. Nice. It's nothing <laughs> Hollywood hasn't been doing for years, <laughs> decades. Um, Mark, you said this was based on personal experience, and you've got a lot of, of filmmaking experience with uh, Automatic Vaudeville Studios. Tell us about um, casting the film and the importance, or if there was any importance, in having name actors in the film. Jacob Tierney uh, is in the film, um, and, uh, and Jessica Paré is in the film. Talk a little bit about that. Was that something that, that you consciously thought of as a way to get your short film seen or, or out there, or not at all? Well, uh, the film, uh, the script actually had its origin uh, with Jessica Paré was m uh, planning to make an anthology fe uh, feature of short films by different directors uh, on the theme of apologizing. And she asked me to contribute a uh, segment to that. Uh, the film didn't end up getting made, but I still had this script, and she encouraged me to work on it and develop it. And when I sort of had a finished script, I sent it to her, and, and she asked if she could be in it. And I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then uh, when we were trying to cast it earlier this year, uh, I just was trying to figure out who could play the lead, and I just couldn't, I've known Jacob for years, and I, I just couldn't get his face out of my head, he just seemed perfect for it, so I, I asked him, I sent him the script, and he uh, very graciously agreed to participate, and so, you know, uh, to answer your question specifically, I, I certainly don't think it hurts the film's prospects, but it was, uh, all the casting was, you know, done because I knew these people, I had relationships with them, and I, I knew that they could really uh, do the right job in the role. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to Dusty Mazzanelli. Dusty directed Pathways. Tell us about your film. Pathways is uh, about a troubled young boy who's walking through the woods one day and comes across an unconscious man with a gun and a briefcase. There we go. <laughs> Clip, please. Lovely trailer. Um, spoiler alert, there's some violence in the film, <laughs> Dusty. Um, I wanted to ask you about that in terms of working with your child actor. I mean, I'm thinking of one scene specifically. How did you navigate um, the violence in the film and, and working with your actor in, in bringing that to life? Uh, we were very fortunate to find a really talented young actor named Vince Perez who was about 10 years old when we shot it. Really, really smart uh, kid. And so we did workshops, went through the script together and discussed, actually uh, intellectualized the scenes and what they were about so that he could uh, understand what what uh, it was all about. And because I, I was told you're never supposed to do that with kids. You're not <laughs> supposed to intellectualize with them. But this, this boy was so smart. And so it was very easy for me to just have that conversation with him and have him ask me those types of questions. And then when we were on set, it was very easy 
to for him to to get into that mode and uh, and he actually had a lot of fun. And we've mm. we've we've got some great footage where he's. I won't spoil anything, <laughs> but it's there's some blood and and uh, he's smiling. So it was actually kind of hard, uh, challenging to to get some takes where he wasn't laughing and smiling <laughs> because he was having he was having a great time. <laughs> Pardon me, <laughs> just a rookie mistake. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, and the parents had no no qualms. Yeah, we, we again we lucked out. We had we had uh, two really great parents. They're really young and very supportive of Vince's career, and were so thrilled that he was uh, working on the film. And they were just completely supportive, so they didn't mm -hmm. question the violence. They understood that the film wasn't about exploiting violence mm -hmm. or using violence in a way uh, in that kind of a way. So uh, they just right right off the bat they were behind the project, and so that really helped us when we had to do those really dramatic, difficult scenes. Mm -hmm. um, they were there actually helping helping with that, and if, if we needed some some kid wrangling, uh, his mom was kind enough to, to step in, so that was really yeah. fortunate. That's good, it's good to hear. It's good to hear. Okay, great, we're gonna move on to uh, Sophie. Sophie Gilliatt and La Ronde, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, La Ronde, yes. We don't uh, know each other very well for now, but uh, I offer you to share a night with me, a special night. Uh, La Ronde is uh, based in Laval, which is a small town in, uh, in Quebec, and um, my artistic approach is really based on locations. I really uh, study them and uh, watch them to see what emotions I can um, get out of them and make locations as well um, characters in the film. And for me, this this small town was uh, really, um, I don't know, that it was sad, it was a bit, uh, th there was something uh, about a, a drama that I wanted to unfold there. So it's about a, a, a young girl uh, and uh, and her, her twin brother uh, who lives, uh, who, who <laughs> shares, um, a, a big family drama, and uh, the the girl has a, an urge to leave, and the boy, uh, her brother, decides to stay. So it's La Ronde. See you quick. Yeah, that's that's the beginning of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful opening, and this is one of those uh, rare short films that actually uh, leaves a lot of breathing room, so it's time for you to sort of immerse yourself in the story. How important was it? And it's 23 minutes long, so it is it's a little on the longer side for a short film. Yes. Tell us uh, about that process and, and how you came to, to make it that length and how important it was to, to allow the film to have that breathing room. Uh, I, I love, well, for all my films, I love when there's breathing room and as well um, when the you let the public have uh, some input in the film so they can um, imagine things as well as the films 
uh, gives, um, how can I say, uh, gives my views, uh, hints, exactly, thank you. And um, so there's a real dialogue between the public and the film. And I think for each of my projects, uh, last year I, I had the chance to be at TIFF with Manage, which was only five minutes. And the project, the film, really has a life on its own in each process, on uh, uh, the writing and the, the shooting, the editing. Um, and you have to listen to that. So La Ronde is uh, my most um, ambitious project. And for sure, I, I knew it wasn't going to be like only uh, five minutes, but uh, I think um, you, you really have to, uh, to uh, how can I say, um, listen to the film uh, and a 23 minutes, like one of the biggest com com compliments is to say, oh my God, I thought it was only 15. So mm -hmm. you don't have, you don't need, when you're making shorts, really don't, uh, you don't have to have the time in mind. It's really the film that's the most important mm -hmm. and the film will tell you. So yeah, it was for, m for, for me, for, for having that, La Ronde is um, a night round, uh, if I can say, till the morning. So I really wanted to be um, a more contemplative, evocative film and I think it serves the movie. Next up, um, Andrew, Andrew Sividino, We Ate the Children Last. Uh, we Ate the Children Last is a science fiction film about a society that uh, embraces a controversial medical procedure without really understanding the consequences. So it's probably a best described as a tale of medical misadventure. It's adapted from uh, the Yann Martel short story of the same name. Uh, and it asks a number of questions, and I think the one that the uh, trailer addresses is, as we continue to modify our bodies, whether it's with technology or biologically uh, with transplants, uh, at what point when we augment our bodies do we have to look at our changing identities? At what point do we have to change the framework of what it means to be human? Let's see some clips. Am I surprised that some people want to stand in the way of progress? Some people jailed Galileo. Some people laughed at Pasteur, and I think that's pretty good company to keep. If you look at history, you will see that the greatest achievements of mankind are not democratic and do not care what some people think or want. Let's talk about unnatural. Breast augmentation, artificial hips, hearing aids. We are surrounded by unnatural human beings are a flawed animal. This procedure is a remedy. This is uh, not a dramatic trailer uh, masking a comedy. This is a, <laughs> a serious drama. Um, spoiler alert, there's um, amazing footage in the film from the G20 uh, event in Toronto last year. I'd love for you to, to talk about um, what made you decide to, to shoot that footage and what the, the dangers or the, the complications were of shooting it because it's so seamlessly integrated into the film that if you weren't here or living it, you may not even know where that footage came from. Well, we knew that it was critical for this film to sell a whole world. We needed a, a large scope, much larger than we could afford to make. Um, as you saw in the trailer, things start to go south and society kind of turns on this uh, group of operated people. Uh, so we had these protest scenes that we wanted to set. And when we heard the G20 was coming to Toronto, we immediately rewrote around that. We, um, we set scenes there with our actors in the G20. We couldn't have anticipated just how far the violence uh, would go. Um, so once things got crazy, we kind of wrapped our actors out and just stuck around and in it. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see the parallels between what happened that day uh, and how it actually plays out in the story. They kind of fit uh, almost eerily well together. So it adds a whole other layer to the film. I love that. Thank you. Uh, Chelsea, our documentarian on the, the panel today. Technical difficulties in the house. Uh, uh, yeah, so my uh, short doc is uh, called Derailments, and uh, it is about uh, Federico Fellini's most famous film, never made, 
uh, which is uh, a film that he wrote about a man traveling through the afterlife that doesn't know he's dead. And uh, there was a lot of mystery around why he actually never completed this film because it was going to be his great sort of masterpiece. And uh, then uh, eventually, towards the end of his life, he made the decision to turn it into a comic with longtime friend and collaborator uh, Milo Monera. Uh, and so the doc is from Milo Monera's perspective of illustrating Fellini's visions of the afterlife. Bellini ne ha dato questa lettura, insomma, di, di uno che, che continua una certa vita senza accorgersene, anche se nella storia completa poi certi segnali lui ce li aveva, ad esempio un aereo che atterra davanti alla cattedrale di Colonia, per esempio, una cosa impossibile a, a, a farsi. Ci sono appunto questi deragliamenti improvvisi che non corrispondono più alla, alla realtà. There's an interesting story behind how this film came to be, uh, how, how it was produced. Um, my subscription to Italian Vogue is really paying off. Um, <laughs> there's a great article in there. Tell us a little bit about uh, how this film came to be. Uh, yeah, so I, um, I sort of moved to Italy and stumbled across Bellini's ghost. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've been living in Italy and working in, a, in an artist residency. And... Uh, I was actually sent on an interview um, that to uh, with Milo Monera that had nothing to do with this film or anything, and I didn't know who he was. But being a really huge Bellini fan, once I found out this story and started doing more research, uh, I was like, "Oh, this would be a really interesting film." Uh, and then I sort of tried to convince them to let me also at the same time do my own interview for my own <laughs> film. Uh, and in, in Italy, he is, uh, Milo Monera is um, like a god, like he's a really, really uh, important figure uh, culturally there. So they were like, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're not letting you near him. <laughs> uh, and then finally I was able to get 20 minutes with him and I was like, yeah, that's great. No, and I, knowing that that would never be enough for me to, to actually do what I wanted to do. So I knew I had to charm my way once I, once I got there. But uh, I think he was actually really honored uh, to be able to sort of tell this really, um, really amazing story. So he ended up giving me two hours of his time and all the rights to all of his uh, work and, and so on and so forth. And he's actually like super happy with the film. So yeah, it ended up oh, okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, leaving the, the crazy uh, or, or audacious 
for last uh, is Craig Goodwill's Patchtown. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, Patchtown is the story of what happened to all the Cabbage Patch kids when their little girls grew up and abandoned them. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, yeah, it's about John who returns back to Patchtown as an adult Cabbage Patch person who picks, processes, and packages the new children to go out into the world. Um, laments every single one because he understands what's actually going to happen to them ultimately as their human girls grow up. Um, and it's very much a, uh, a dark comedy and it's a musical. Um, all of which you will not be able to get from the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> so, patch down. You know how to cut a trailer. I think I'm having heart palpitations <laughs> from the excitement. Uh, this is uh, quite an ambitious film. It's, uh, I think, probably the longest short film in the festival at 28 minutes. In the world, actually. In the world. Yeah, I don't know. I've seen longer. Um, <laughs> tell us about why this story. Where did this come from, first of all? Uh, it came from a, a long, boring day on a film set uh, with my Russian script supervisor. And we were talking about where babies come from. I don't know why we were talking about it. <laughs> uh, I said, uh, my parents said the stork delivered us. And uh, she said, well, I grew up in the cabbage patch. And that night, she sent me a photo, a Russian photo, of a fetus inside of a cabbage. And so it kind of just blew my mind. And then I was like, well, I guess that's where this whole cabbage patch thing came from. So then it kind of led to the idea of, well, what happens when these it's a kind of the transference of love. And these little girls love these dolls so much. What happens to all that love once all the little girls grow up? So we created this world. Um, we had a much longer script. Uh, but through the, uh, we really used the musical as a device to be able to communicate context and character and description uh, at a much quicker pace time. Um, and then, you know, add in Julian Richings and Lisa Ray and the gentleman from Evil Dead the Musical wrote all the lyrics. So it really was a wonderful coming together of, uh, of talent. So. How long did it take you to make this? Uh, started it seven years ago. <laughs> and, and this is my first short film, so I had to do a longer one to make up for all the talent that's on the <laughs> stage. I had all theirs. <laughs> Um, seven years ago, but life and things and, you know, could be on the back burner. But really, I think three years ago, uh, our producer writer, Catherine Gordier, uh, who's here, um, we really started to hammer away at the script. And uh, then Judy Gladstone at Bravo, uh, Tasso Lapis at Pitt Program of Actra, um, really gave us the kind of confidence to move ahead. It's a weird thing. We had to create, we storyboarded the entire film. We created an animatic visual effects, dialogue, music, to really pitch it because everybody's like, you're crazy to move ahead with such an ambitious project. But we had, again, really smart people around us. And we had a, and we've been doing this in film for a while and we've been around other really talented people. So we've kind of leaned on their experience and uh, to make the product we did. It's, there's nothing else like it. I've seen a lot of shorts. I've never Thank seen you. one like that, so congratulations. Um, I wanted to, to ask you all um, a slightly philosophical question. What does short film mean to you? Is it a means to an end, or how do you feel about it as an art form in itself? Why is short film important to you? Let's start with you. Um, 
I definitely don't see shorts as a, a means to an end. I think if you look at uh, poetry and short fiction, are great examples in literature, there are ideas and concepts, uh, feelings, moments, things that can happen, can only happen in a briefer period of time. Uh, so I think the, I mean, the, the feature is king in the sense that that's where there's money, like there's a market there, but I think as like a form for us as filmmakers, the short is entirely relevant. Well, I think we will uh, like each other because I'm uh, completely uh, uh, with you on that. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that it's not a step towards a long feature. I think it's short is really a mark on itself. And we see it uh, right now. There are some great directors who uh, really are uh, celebrities and they come back to shorts because it's really, it's the idea that uh, directs the length of the film. I really think about that. And sometimes you see features and you're like, that could have been a great short, mm -hmm. and maybe otherwise, but, um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, for me, short, I, I love when uh, I sense, um, if it's a more conventional short, I, I love that when, when there's a sense that the main character is really at a changing point of his, his life. It's like a, a, a brief moment when you catch an emotion or something, or you don't not n know even why, but there there's really something really precious that you, are able to catch and even more so uh, sometimes shorts are more difficult to make and learn because it's really uh, you have to be concise and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree with both, both of what you guys said. Um, I, I've, always, I've always loved short fiction and I, uh, when I started off writing journalism, all my first assignments were to write really, really short things and having to do that over and over again uh, gave me really appreciation for all the work you have to do to make something that is small but but works and, and has all its sort of gears in, in place. Uh, so I think short films can be a means to an end, uh, can be a way to get to making a feature, but I really like them on their own as uh, little, s n little nicely designed things that exist uh, sort of independently. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, agree <laughs> with. Uh, <laughs> All right, four for the four. <laughs> the, the the last three. I'll just add that you know I think there um, also with shorts um, the stakes not necessarily always being as high. Um, I think it uh, it provides a filmmaker sometimes with the ability to really experiment with particularly with mm -hmm. form. Um, and I know that's something that I really enjoy doing, particularly in documentary. Um, so, so dabbling in, in hybridity and, and sort of showing that, yeah, you are able to sort of do this and if you wanted to sort of develop something longer. So I, I think that's another element uh, to, to sort of re, you know, sort of build on what everyone has said so far. But I really agree sort of I, I, some of the best films I've seen have, have been shorts and I think they do, do merit sort of their own um, place in, in cinema. Mm. I also agree. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I see shorts as a, a self-contained piece of work, and, and as everyone else has said, it's the story itself really dictates the length, and it's sometimes it's incredibly challenging to try to find um, to try to find a story that feels self-contained that doesn't necessarily feel like you're making an intro to a feature that you want to make. But at the same time, it's really exciting to be able to experiment and find your voice as a filmmaker. Use short films as a way to practice telling stories, um, and so that if I, I definitely want to move into the feature realm, and so I see shorts as a, a setting or two to, to, to be able to develop those kinds of skills. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be the only one that doesn't. Uh, I'm he, uh, there's a means to an end for me, um, and with Patchtown, definitely we wanted to create a world that people would want to learn more about, and short films are incredible and the amount of work you have to put into making a short film is outrageous <laughs> as compared to and having worked on features it's incredible the the constraints you have to deal with um, i agree that short films are great because they can show uh, a moment in time or an emotional context but for me it's about pr providing those insights into a character that's or a project or a story that an audience wants to learn more about. So I kind of view it from a little bit different, um, and it just based on the sweat equity <laughs> that you put into a short, um, um, for me it's more about, uh, we're working on uh, The Murder of Tom Thompson is the next one, 
and the following one is uh, Louis Riel, the musical. So we are really uh, interested in making kind of broad sweeps, um, but uh, picking a moment in time that the audience can really connect to and then hopefully be interested in a larger project. Mm -hmm. I, I, are you planning on turning any of your shorts into features? Uh, we're uh, Patch Town. We just uh, finished the full-length feature draft, and uh, we are about to announce this week that uh, we're going to be making it into a feature. So right. we're very excited. And we're going to be using about 75% of the content, because mm -hmm. we shot a lot of stuff. We shot the visual effects, uh, some of the music scenes were incredibly intricate and expensive, and the rain was not us but God, so <laughs> we're going to use it. and. Uh, we're going to use part of that into the feature. And so it's very exciting. And so it's, uh, I kind of look at it kind of like a District 9 model. Mm -hmm. uh, District 9 started off as a short film and blew up into a larger film and really like that idea of being able to showcase your talent in something. And especially ours is 27 minutes. So, <laughs> uh, so and I like the idea of being able to explore the idea of showing people you can create a whole arc. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. It's true, and, and the film stands alone as a short film. And there are actually two other examples I can think of in the festival this year of feature films that started as short films, and I think there's a, a, a significant amount of content from those shorts that made it into the feature. Um, Pariah from the USA, I don't know if any of you have seen that. Fantastic, fantastic short, fantastic feature. And Lucky from South Africa started as, a, I think, a 15-minute short. They actually changed the gender of one of the protagonists for the feature. So an interesting evolution of the short into a feature. Um, what have each of you learned making shorts? Um, I guess what's, what's been the biggest lesson that you've learned making shorts that you plan to take with you either into features or into further short filmmaking? Let's run down the line. Uh, I think one of the most important things I've learned from doing shorts is that uh, development is everything. Your, your story, your script, everything needs to be perfect in development because if you even leave a small hole, by the time the, you're through production, you're gonna have a, a gaping hole in your film. And I think like you cannot kill the camera until you've got something that it, like, is, is bulletproof. Uh, I don't think you can leave things to the, the fates and, and hope that it's gonna turn out. So that's, that's mm -hmm. one little nugget I'd probably share. That's a good question. Uh, good question. Um, I would say, well, yeah, that I will take on my uh, features, but as well as all my artistic approach, trust your instinct uh, always. Like, uh, sometimes when we're, I th there's so much, like making a film is really, really, really difficult. You really have to give it all, make it a short or, or, or feature length. Really, it's, but it, it, it I, I encourage all the filmmakers that want to don't. Uh, I it's it's amazing to do, but it's really difficult. And I think um, in the general processes, because there you need money, you need people, you need a fabulous team. Uh, it, it it's a working project. Y really, um, you at each step you can change your movie uh, for for making it uh, whatever you you want till the end till the editing. So I uh, really would say, like, just even if if it seems uh, a, a, a big, big project with uh, 20 uh, person on your team, uh, really make it personal because it's your own voice. And yeah, I don't know. Mm. That would be more artistic of the response. But yeah. That's valid advice. That's very good. Uh, I'll, I'm going to go from the artistic to very prosaic. Uh, I, we only had uh, three days to shoot this movie that had a lot of uh, locations, interiors and exteriors. We had actors who could only be there for certain times and certain days. So I was very anxious about uh, how it was all going to go down. So to sort of like calm my anxieties, I spent hours and hours and hours storyboarding with a friend of mine. I never storyboarded before. And that process turned out to be uh, really, really unbelievably helpful uh, creatively because it really was sort of like directing the film shot by shot. Uh, ahead of time. So going back to what you're saying about development, it was sort of uh, having that and having the storyboards there on set really helped us uh, because we had so many shots to get through every day and just knowing exactly uh, what we needed, uh, even though that obviously it changed a little bit on set, it changed in the edit, uh, was uh, definitely a lesson I'll take with me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, sort of being able to work with sort of uh, different, within sort of different uh, restraints and or constraints. Uh, 
uh, budgetary and otherwise. Um, I feel like just being able to adapt to the project and you know working with bigger budgets and smaller budgets, I think I've sort of run the gamut <laughs> and sort of pulled through and proven that I can sort of do it on a wide range of, of, of different projects and different approaches. Uh, and the other thing is just, uh, I think, uh, creating um, really strong relationships uh, with your crew. Like, I, I, I really have worked with the same people um, for, like, the last eight years and uh, and really have developed a shorthand and a style and, uh, and really um, working on developing those relationships has been really important to me. And, and I just want to, you know, um, continue to develop them in case they go the next project, whether they be long term or, or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the importance of your collaborators and partners on shorts is. Yeah, it's essential crucial. for me, I think. Yeah, yeah <coughs> I, I think you can never be too prepared. And I think that was one of the biggest lessons I've learned over the years is just the more you prepare and plan and do shot lists and storyboards. For me, it, it develops, it, it creates a, a confidence within me and allows me to. Uh, feel secure about what story I'm trying to tell. And on, on set, you're constantly making so many different choices. And uh, Murphy's Law, everything always goes wrong on a set. And so learning to have, like like Chelsea said, that kind of flexibility to know, be so confident, to know what, what story you're really trying to tell and be so prepared that really anything can happen on set, any obstacle or mm -hmm. challenge. And you can overcome those obstacles and challenges because ultimately you really know what story you're trying to tell and you can make sacrifices on the day with, with confidence. And, and I also um, I think collaboration is so crucial to making uh, a, good, a good film. I don't think uh, the director or the writer is the sole creator. And I, I think really you, it's, it's the magic of finding really talented individuals mm -hmm. that come together in this kind of harmonious way to tell, and, and everyone is trying to tell that, that same story. And, and the more prepared you are, if you can visually, like uh, Craig said, uh, do these animatics and visually show people what your, what your vision is, I think it's a lot easier to get these creative collaborators on board with, with the same idea. And, uh, and so that's also incredibly crucial. I think filmmaking is incredibly collaborative and mm -hmm. it's really important to develop those relationships. Um, have fun and wear comfortable shoes. Uh, and I truly, I think it's, you know, you, you lose sight when you're on set and you, it can get stressful and a lot of anxiety and different things and you're running out of time and you're running 12 hours and you're, and you think that's a lot of time, but when you're lighting for the first two, you start realizing that you're running out. Um, and ultimately everybody on set is, looking for someone to be the leader. As much as it's a collaboration, it's not a democracy. Um, it is, it, and it's gonna fall down on your shoulders, the success and the failure. So you have to make sure that everybody has a clear understanding of the vision, people understand that we're, and I, you're all we wanna communicate that you're not there to waste their time or money. So it's important that Someone's the leader, is, but uh, never turn down a good idea, wherever it may come from. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully you're prepared enough on set to allow that magic to happen or the variables to come into play. So it's, uh, but having fun and uh, enjoying yourself and having that camaraderie on set really al is wonderful, especially when you need to actually get down to business and not be able to put a cherry on top of every comment that or a, a request that you make. So. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an ebb and flow, but um, it's enjoying the process, which is very important mm -hmm. because it flows by so quickly that you wish uh, you had a moment to uh, thank people and be, uh, be more communicative in those moments. Preparation, collaboration, trust, fun. Yeah, that's filmmaking in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, turn it over to you, uh, our audience, with questions, either general questions for all of the panelists or specific questions about films. Please. Oh, we've got a microphone coming so we can capture this. Thank you. I was just wondering for all of you except Chelsea, um, if you worked with union actors and if you didn't, why didn't you? Let's have a uh, quick answer to that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, we worked with Actra. Uh, Canada is a great talent. Um, and uh, we worked under the TIP program, uh, which is um, basically your background to making more than Lisa Ray. And like, and, but you are... 
you have to inspire those. It's all about inspiration and passion. And um, I know Mark has also had actors that flew it like we, you know, Lisa could be there for a day and a half. And that's all she could provide us. And it was a great treasure to us. And we were very honored. Um, but yeah, you, and there's a lot of rules. Like we had 60, we had 20 main cast and 60 background. So yeah, and meal penalties are terrible. So you just want to be, you have to be on it. And it's so it's an adds to a whole thing. So, and you can't go 16 hours. Like as we're, we just want to go, go, go. And as much as the actors want to, you can't. And uh, so you really got to make sure you understand what you're there to do on that day. Our cast and crew was, uh, sorry, our cast was non-union. Uh, it was too large for our, our budget to allow for it. And um, the actor has some really great programs that allow you to, to work with a lower budget, uh, but you need to have all of your talent be union. Um, we just had, we, I mean, with our crowd scenes, with everything, like there was no way that we were gonna be able to do that. But non-union doesn't mean you can't find good actors. It just means that it's a much bigger haystack that you've got to search through when you get all sorts of people who come into your auditions, that's it's true. like, a, a, that's a film in, in of itself, so. <laughs> I think that casting is a really big step in a film, uh, and then can really like uh, uh, go brilliantly or even ruin a film. And I think that for me, an actor or even a non-professional, non uh, you have to choose a good person for, like for this film, for La Ronde, I, um, it's with actors that I found in plays years ago. I wrote their name and said, okay, you, 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 um, cast. Uh, and for my lattice, l l lattice this summer, I just uh, went in the small airport and I chose uh, airplane pilots, non-professional, and I did my, and I, I combined this with uh, actors non-union. And I think everything's possible in film. So your question specifically was like, is, is there, Um, well, for this, I did uh, need to get a union, but I, I think that, uh, I don't know if you're an actress or, yes, and you're non-union, you're union, and you find that there are barriers or? Uh well, I was just curious, oh, thank you. I was just curious uh, if you found there were barriers, if you wanted to work with a union, and if you found that to be too hard, like in his case, or I what? Yeah, I, I want to work with the, the best person for that role. So I, I there's no standard for me, really not. And I ob observe people all the time. So uh, I will, if I see an actor in a play or in a, sh a TV show that I love and he's women perfect, I will make the film around hi him. Or if I found an old couple sitting next to me in the restaurant, I will stand up and go see them and say, I have a small role for you. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked, actually, and they were brilliant. Like, it's the preparation with that. So um, I know there are syndicals, uh, things that we have to follow, but especially in short, like uh, she said, like, you have liberty, so you can work with that. I think. Yes, we, we were actra, uh, we we're working with the same sort of low budget uh, agreement that you had mentioned. Um, and yeah, to a certain extent, it, it uh, you know, we had a smaller pool to choose from when looking for our actors, but we found who we needed and uh, I, w I was pretty happy altogether with the, with the way it turned out. Uh, we went non-union as well, uh, as well as Andrew. And uh, uh, me and my producing partner, Harry, Harry Cherniak, we self-financed our film, so we didn't have a lot of money and we made that decision really early on that we were going to do an open casting call and go non-union. But also our, our lead actor, uh, Vince Perez, is we, we knew we needed a young boy who could speak Italian. And so we really wanted to open up our, our search for that. And we felt that if we, there, there are not too many young Italian speaking actor kids. So it was, we wanted to uh, go to community centers and um, really a, a wide range of people to, to come into the door and see to see who we can get, and but it's it is a really exhaustive search uh, to find those people. We have a question in there. Yeah. Uh, when you guys make your movies, do you think about the audience, and what do you hope the audience gets out of your movie? Mm, good question. What do you want the audience to get out of your film, and are you thinking about them when you're making them? I, I always think about the audience. Um, this project is is not some personal 
project that's deep in my soul, like I had Cabbage Patch Children when I was a child and I needed to fully realize the idea or I couldn't go move on in my life. Uh, it, it was a really, it was a story I wanted to tell and it, we really wanted to tap into that nostalgia that no one had really done yet. So for us, it is, we always thought about the audience. Um, and I think that's, as me as a filmmaker, that's all I think about. And I wanted, I, what did I want them to get out of this film? I wanted them coming out going, oh my God, did you just, what the hell was that? <laughs> and, and whistling the music and, and had a good smile and a good laugh. And I think that's, that's how I see my job as a filmmaker is to create uh, films and experiences that people can escape from. Uh, for two hours in their life, and uh, the world's crazy enough. Um, you know, it'd be nice to give them a break every so often. So. Yeah, I think about the audience a lot as well. I think it's really important to make sure that you're telling a story that the audience can understand and follow, and, and it's your that your vision is being expressed clearly, I think, is what's really important to me, that that's guided. Um, and also, you, I, I really want the audience, I, I want the film to resonate with the audience. I want. I want my film to evoke some kind of thought and, and something. Um, but at the same time, uh, if you think about the audience, I think too much, it can be really daunting because you can get caught up in this internal dialogue with yourself, trying to appease everyone, and you can never appease everyone. And so it's a fine balance, I think, when, when you're thinking about the audience and telling, telling stories that you want to reach a large audience and you want people to understand your story and, and have that resonate with them to also feel confident that, and know that you're not gonna, you're not, uh, not everyone's gonna like your film, and that's okay. Sorry, I think it goes both ways, just in response to that, you know, you have to be responsible to the audience, um, because as filmmakers also, we can get rather self-indulgent onto the scene, so it's, 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 a, it's a fine balance sometimes. Um, and it's true, you can't, at the end of the day, it's your final decision, your final vision, what you're going forward with, and you hope the audience likes what you do. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, w usually when I, I'm developing a film, uh, I don't I don't really consider that. Definitely uh, in sort of post um, for clarity and and to try to to um, yeah to to make sure that what I'm trying to say is, is getting across. I, I hope that you know I, I think you know in storytelling, um, working with some like pretty universal themes like this film like what really drew me to the story was. Um, this idea when I'm thinking about Fellini, and I think it's also where I was in my life, this idea of sort of art and death and how the two sort of confront and uh, and uh, confront each other and also um, affect each other. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I really feel like it was sort of about him facing his own mortality and how that affects our, our art. Um, and so I feel those like are pretty universal themes. Um, and uh, so I, I never really considered too much the audience uh, until sort of the end when I when I obviously um, I don't uh, I don't really intend to say the end result is always I hope people watch it and get something out of it so that's really important to me um, and and definitely making films for an audience not just for myself to <laughs> watch in my bedroom uh, <laughs> sometimes that happens uh, but really sort of, yeah, try to bring something innovative and new and sort of meditation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I felt in my film I had, uh, I thought there was very little margin for error because I had a very short amount of time and there was a lot of, you know, just from a very practical level, a lot of story beats that I wanted to fit in. I wanted there to be moments that were funny and uh, I wanted to think about whether the audience would have time to laugh and, you know, uh, not run over the next line. So I think when you're, especially when you make a short, there, like I said, there's very little margin for error. And so I really, especially during post, had to think very hard about was I communicating everything I wanted to communicate? Was the story being told clearly? Uh, were there moments when I wanted some, some space for the audience? Were they there? Uh, it became this, you know, uh, pretty intricate creative problem solving exercise. And I actually find that very enjoyable. So yes, to, I guess uh, when I do that kind of thing, it's entirely about the audience and whether they're going to uh, receive the communication that I am trying to, sorry, that sentence just uh, went nowhere. Uh, <laughs> whether they're gonna get it <laughs> is probably a simpler way to say that. <laughs> um, 
actually, for me, no, I don't think in the creative process about the audience, and it, not in a non-generous way, because I want as well to have a, a conversa conversation between the films and the public, but I think that the response of the public is the magical part of the film, because you never know what to expect, and I love when um, each person's sensibility gets something different from the film, because even me, I don't know what, yes, there's a story, yes, there's an emotion that's personal, and but I, I never know what the land uh, that I'm putting out there and what will get, and yeah, I, 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 the, 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 the market is la large, like something, you, you uh, every public is different around the world, around the festival, and it's really like fascinating to see how they respond to that. So I, I'm really in my, um, uh, how can I say, uh, in my head trying to say, okay, I, I want to share this, communicate this, but how they will respond, I don't know. And yeah, I think it's, uh, I want it to be that way, so. Last word to Andrew. I, um, I show a rough cut to my mom, and if she doesn't like it, I know I'm in big trouble. <laughs> 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 uh, no, uh, we went through like, um, like eight or nine cuts, and I'm really protective early on. Um, in it's mostly in, I show lots of drafts in writing, and I show also in cuts, and I'm very protective early on until the idea is at a point where I feel like I'm ready to communicate it, like I, th I think it's doing what it's supposed to, and then I show it with people I trust, and I see if they're getting what I think I'm, I'm sending out. Uh, and then I, I, I try to show people in smaller groups so I can keep fresh eyes that I trust throughout the editing process. The Mun test is a good one. <laughs> we have to leave it there. There's much more to discuss. These uh, folks have made amazing films. There are still screenings of shorts left in the festival. Please see shorts. And please thank our panelists, Andrew, Sophie, Mark, Chelsea, Dusty, Craig. Thank you. Thank you.